Hey everybody, what is up? Welcome to episode, or excuse me, season two, episode six of Teach Play Disc Golf. I'm so excited to be here. I'm your host, Antonio, and today, everybody, I have a very special guest with me, someone that I have enjoyed watching his content for a couple years now at this point. We have Yanni from Yanni Going Places, or as you might know him on YouTube, DG Spin Doctor on the show. Yanni, how are you doing, man? Thank you, Antonio. I'm doing pretty great at the moment. It's Sunday. It's July. Yeah. I mean, we're on holidays. I, I hope you are. I am. So there's That's great. nothing to cl complain about. That is great. Love to hear that. Uh, I'm so excited to have you on the show uh, today. It has been something I've been looking forward to as we've been talking for a couple weeks, trying to figure out a time uh, and day that we can make this work. And I really, really appreciate you. So for the listeners, in case you don't know, there's about an eight to nine hour time difference between me and Yanni between Nashville and Helsinki. So uh, we definitely took some coordinating and figuring out what could happen and jumping on the first opportunity that we were able to make it happen. So I am super excited, but uh, let's go ahead and let's run through the outline for the show so that you guys know what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about uh, the disc golf skill in the backhand throw. We're going to pick Yanni's brain and just figure out how can we improve our form? How can we improve our distance, our accuracy, really get into some of the nitty gritty here. And then we are going to review his favorite disc, the Axiom NB, and I'm super excited to chat about that. Uh, but if you guys want some extra info, if you want to learn a little bit about how Yanni found the sport, what you know, how long he's been playing, and some extra insight into the game, go ahead and check out the class in session, the pre-show. It's for paid subscribers only. That that content is never shared out. So when you pay for it, a few dollars a month, you get premium content with every guest that we have on the show. So if you want. You can join on YouTube or on Spotify to check that out. But without further ado, let's get into it. All right, everybody. So we're going to talk. We're going to talk about the backhand throw, and I'm super excited for this. And we're just going to start with one really big overarching question for you, Yanni. What is your number one tip? I know that there's a lot in the backhand throw, but if you had to kind of boil it down for someone, either a beginner or even more intermediate and advanced, what's one thing that you find yourself telling a lot of disc golf students? Well, yeah, there, there's one that is above all, and that is relax, relax, relax mm -hmm. the arm. I mean, basically you need a sturdy front leg and a relaxed arm. And uh, that is the number one tip. And basically all of my sessions, when I meet the student for the first time, it's, it's all about relaxing, relaxing. Lower your shoulders, relax your arm, grip the disc firmly enough, but that's it. The, mm -hmm. the only point of tension basically should be on your fingers and that's it. Uh, you need to think about the whip. The arm mm. is the whip, the body or the front side of the body is the handle and the tip of the whip are mm -hmm. your fingers. So that's it. Relax as much as you can. And people don't realize this. Uh, they they usually feel like they're so relaxed, but mm -hmm. then I try to wiggle their arm and I feel like, no, it's, <laughs> it's an iron bar here. Like, you need to relax so much more. Yeah. And I get it. I've been a student also. Like I took some singing lessons uh, a, a few years ago. And guess guess what was the number one tip my teacher gave me? Like that was the basically the only thing we talked about. Yeah. Relax your throat, relax, relax, yeah. relax your stomach. I, I am relaxed. It doesn't <laughs> sound like that. <laughs> so how do you so relaxation? How do you take them? How do you take them from where they think they're relaxed to genuinely being relaxed? Well, I try to be as relaxed as possible myself. So I try to create also uh, a very positive environment. I try mm -hmm. to speak in a calm manner also. Like, we're just here tossing plastic. That's it. Yeah. And it's like, uh, like, 
like I consider myself a therapist for disc golf. So we're we're there standing standing loosely. We don't there's no rush. We got mm-hmm. 90 minutes and if we have 5 minutes of super focused good uh practicing there, that's all you need. So we don't have to rush through. Mm-hmm. Then of course we we might like do a little dancing there also just Mm -hmm. get the feel that we are in our bodies Mm -hmm. Uh, hanging our hands low arms low and just doing very preliminary yoga stuff also like i'm not i'm not i'm not giving any any yoga tips but just like it's relaxing and breathing yeah so basically i'm just trying to create an environment where you don't have to tense and you Mm-hmm. don't have to be nervous about my presence also because some people mm-hmm. also they know me from the internet so people mm-hmm. might be a bit like starstruck which feels awkward but <laughs> I also that that might yeah so people might be very tense and yeah. i also try to talk to my students in their language like their their way of talking Mm-hmm. I try to get into their mindset. Like, what are you doing there? What are you thinking there? And I try to address that in their mm-hmm. way of speaking. Right. And I've had really like positive experiences doing that. And I think more than instructions, I might just create a space for them to let go. Mm-hmm. Because that's the most important aspect in our lives to just let go and let happen mm-hmm. and relax and not tense and force things. Sometimes it doesn't take uh, much. Sometimes it takes a couple of sessions, but yeah, people have improved. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. I, I'm not going to lie. I feel pretty relaxed right now. <laughs> uh, yeah. Good. That's, that's, uh, that's re- I really love the element there of, helping them relax even more than they think they are because like, you know, so many times we feel relaxed and it's like, well, am I actually like my shoulders are still pinched up? Like just even a normal life, like you're at work, you're like, yeah, I feel relaxed, but you're sitting around walking around like this. Like this is a universal sign that you're tense, that you're stressed and all these things. And if this is how you're trying to throw the disc, your body is rigid. It can't move. And for those of you who are listening, like, my shoulders are up to my ears kind of thing. Um, it is definitely important to relax. We know that relaxed muscles are the, the best moving, the strongest. There's a reason why you see professional athletes take a breath, slow their body down before doing some kind of uh, explosive activity. Uh, obviously, not all sports are conducive. You have to you know, react pretty quickly. Like with American football, you don't have time to take a breath every time before you, you know, run around someone or tackle someone, but it's this setting up the play, that moment to breathe, take a second. Same thing that we see in uh, soccer or football and all these other sports, but especially disc golf, throwing things. We see pitchers in baseball and uh, players in tennis do the same thing. They relax before hitting. And it's super important to do that. And so I'd love to sort of now transition from, okay, we've gotten relaxed. We're, um, we're not feeling the physical tension of the throw in our body. How should we go and set up our throw? What is your recommendation? Well, there are a couple of schools of thought here. Mm -hmm. Some people think that you have to, I mean, if, if we're talking about just the setup, how you stand mm-hmm. uh, on your lie. So basically, some people think that you should show a bit more uh, of your backside to the target. I think it's more of the, um, like the side of your front leg or your mm-hmm. front knee that shows to the target so that I mean, this is very hard to explain without actually showing, showing oh, the I under- stance. I understand. Yeah, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about creating a straight line from mm-hmm. the back of the hand or, or, or the, from, from the disc 
in the peak of the reach back to the target. Mm -hmm. So basically, that is like my ideal. Some people think that uh, you have to use a bit more of your body so that you show a bit more of the uh, like the butt cheek of your back right. leg to the target. Right. I'm not in that school, but okay. for some, I can see that works. But I feel that you have to create uh, a sort of a setup that there is nothing between the disc and the mm -hmm. intended target. So right. that's what I think it's is the best yeah. setup. Yeah, and you know, I think that I, I agree with that. And one of the things that I feel like is I've I've talked with some other uh, disc golf coaches and content creators on the show before. And one thing I feel that we're really dealing with in disc golf is like, like any sport, there are a lot of different people that come and play with different history, sports backgrounds, all these things. So what movements are natural to them? What isn't natural to them and everybody's body responds differently. And so I think as, as you sort of stated there, the important thing is that you have a clean line for the disc to pass through without coming into your body. So in essence, you're avoiding this problem called rounding one, but then two, the degree, I think to which somebody might plant their foot or whether it's just the side of their leg or a little bit more than that, I think we're starting to notice that a lot of it just comes with, you know, what's comfortable to the individual, what's more natural for them, what helps them achieve that. And obviously we want to have, we want to make sure that somebody's not doing something that's going to cause future injury down the road by putting unnecessary tension and stress on their lower body. But I feel like we're slowly in a good way. We are coming to this, uh, this like stance where like, yeah, this is what we're all wanting to achieve this clean line for the disc to pass through. And all of us might be positioned a little differently, but as long as we're achieving that and not in impinging on our, on ourselves, like that's, that's where it's going to be great. And so I really, really yeah. like that element. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, if I see my student, like taking that sort of a diagonal stance mm -hmm. and it works great for them, then I say, okay, mm -hmm. keep at it. I mean, I won't force you into my stance if you're doing great with that kind of run-up and that kind right. of stance and it seems to work for you. So let's work with that. Mm -hmm. So there are no like set rules. Yeah. So we've, uh, we're obviously talking here a lot about, you know, stand still and kind of setting up the throw, which I, I love throwing stances. I think it's an important skill that um, every disc golfer should learn. And I'm a firm believer that like the stand still and the, the skills I use there will help you uh, with your X step and really sort of generating a little bit more power through the X step. But one of the things that I've been dealing with and one of the things that I'm uh, working through, but also like coaching and trying to help with is how do you, what is your recommendation for transferring the uh, the timing and everything from a standstill into an X step where you're now adding that additional movement before, if that question makes sense. It does. Standstills have always been quite difficult for me. So I prefer doing the one stepper. So I just, it's a very small step forward, but mm -hmm. I get the feeling of the weight transfer mm. a lot easier okay. that way. If I throw, if I have to throw, like I'm forced to throw like a complete standstill because right. of the terrain is, is, is somewhat tricky. Then I just focus on pushing the front leg down, mm -hmm. like down on the ground. So my body moves, it, it, it kind of has to move forward, uh, to be able to move down also. So mm -hmm. that's my weight transfer. And I also get a better feeling for the balance that is super necessary to be able to, to do the throw. So I try to emphasize my front leg going down, like deep into the ground. It feels mm -hmm. like I'm trying to bury my leg there and okay. then throw, even if it's a, even if it's a standstill, but especially if I take a one stepper, I, mm. I get it a bit easier because I have the momentum. And if we transfer from, from the X step to the, um, like the basic stance we throw with the X step is only 
like momentum, mm -hmm. like added momentum. It's there, there's nothing fancier in it, just added right. momentum. And basically all throws are standstill, you know, standstill yeah. with an X step, like just yeah. to get some momentum yeah. for the standstill. <laughs> yeah. You're not throwing in the X step that it changes things. It's just <laughs> building up that momentum. But I definitely think there's a mental thing that a lot of players will almost they, they have to work through this mental block of, okay, I was throwing standstill and now I go to the X step and they almost like, I've, I, I've seen it. They sort of lose what they've built with their standstill and they try to like really rip and throw the discard. And we see a lot of those things come out of timing and we see a lot more arm throws and shoulders rotating super fast um, because they're just, they're actually trying to throw it hard. And I think it, that, it just comes back to the very first tip that you give, like, hey, you're not throwing relaxed. If you were throwing relaxed, yeah. you wouldn't be doing that. And so I just love how everything is just really connecting, uh, connected to each other, which really helps sort of diagnose some of the issues that we have in the form. And, you know, one of the things that when I coach and uh, when I talk on here or on the YouTube channel uh, in an instructional video is I want people to be able to like watch a video or listen to a podcast episode, understand and learn and be able to self-diagnose and be able to implement the changes themselves. It's not just about, hey, come to me or come to Yanni or come to anyone for information, but it's like, hey, you should feel equipped to be able to start noticing these things on your own and everybody's at a different path in that journey you know how long they've been playing how uh, how much of a student they are of the game and those kinds of things but i love being able to start making connections like that so that a player can take them and be like oh you know what that throw i did not feel super relaxed i didn't take a breath before and be able to go and implement that change immediately on the next one and say hey this next one i know i'm off the fairway because i had a bad drive but i rushed it so now let me slow down take that breath and then let me throw nice and relax. And when a play, I feel like if a coach can get a player to do that, that is successful coaching. It's not just, Hey, yeah, I helped you throw 50, 75, hundred feet further. It's I help you got to the point where you are now coaching yourself. You have the tools and the education and the, and the ability to do that. And I think that's really important. Um, to be able to do in the coaching, which is why I love that you also address that mental side. So speaking of all this, you, I love that you talked about the power, like planting that plant foot deep into the ground. Like you're trying to just stick it, you know, three, six feet under. I love that. Is that the only way that you think about generating power or like, how do you think about with while staying relaxed, obviously, generating the power that's necessary to throw a 400 foot shot 500 foot shot whatever it is yeah so my take on this is that i mean we we all know that the fast arm like we need to make our arm as fast as possible mm -hmm. but the body itself it cannot really make our arm any faster i mean there is this little small spark that ignites like the first like first little spark uh, peak of power mm -hmm. and then the arm has to go like really loosely forward so the i think one of the misconceptions is that you throw with the whole body i mean naturally we use the whole body and the body must follow the movements of our arm but most people think that the more they move their body the faster they move the disc and this is not true the disc is such a light object, 175 mm -hmm. grams. We're not dealing with a five, five pound plate here. Yeah. So we need to move the arm as fast as possible. So I would steer the focus from the whole body to the arm. We want to swing the arm as fast as possible. And the body merely follows the move. It looks like the body moves first and it really does move first when we throw really hard, but it does so because, well, this is my theory. I'm no neurologist. Oh, you're it, good. It does so because the body has to anticipate the movements of the arm. 
in order to uh, prevent itself from hurting. Okay. So the more mobile we are, the more flexible we are, the faster we are, because the body doesn't restrict the movements of the arm. It doesn't have to slow down. And when we move the arm as fast as possible, with one supporting point, which is the front leg, there is nothing that can hold the body from not doing the right moves. So if we focus solely on swinging the arm really fast, with a little bit of added mm -hmm. momentum before that, that's all you need. And the body will move accordingly. Okay. So, so basically, if, if, if I... If I like make it short, you cannot make the arm faster with the body, but you can make it slower with the body. So if you use the whole body to move yeah. the arm, it's, it's slow basically. And, okay. and this is like, like this can cause also rounding, which we can talk about later. Oh yeah, for sure. Okay. <laughs> I, I think I'm, you know, I've never heard it described in that way. And so. I'm definitely like processing the things that you're saying and uh, yeah, it's just taking me a second to really process it. I've never heard it described that way, but I, I do think that it makes sense. I do think that it sounds like some, and obviously correct me if I'm wrong, if I'm misunderstanding, but um, it almost sounds like sometimes we get in our own way by trying to do something. And what we want to do is not be getting in our way to execute at peak performance. If exactly. That, that's, okay. Exactly. And when we try to tense our whole body to move mm -hmm. as fast as possible, and we're, you're tense again. If you just swing the arm and you mm -hmm. let it swing all the way around you, which is the follow through, mm -hmm. you'll see that your body reacts even before the arm mm -hmm. just 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 happens so <laughs> yeah but of no. course if, if 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 you have stiff hips and you're just spending all your life sitting on a computer and then you start throwing of course that doesn't happen yeah but yeah. you have to trust your body's intuition to move in a yeah. way that you don't you won't get hurt yeah i definitely think that that last part there especially is something that is so important is learning to trust your body and get comfortable with being uncomfortable you know one of the things that's really hard is we know most golfers know intellectually mentally what the throw is supposed to look like and how they're supposed to do it but to go from knowing it up here in our heads to doing it with our body there's a huge disconnect there. And a lot of times I think not all the time, but a lot of times I think that there are moments where we try to outthink or outsmart ourselves instead of just letting our body move in its natural way. Um, and so I, yeah, I really no, and also, uh, cool. yeah, no, yeah. Yeah. And also, I yeah, I mean, I, I just want to elaborate on what you said. People, mm -hmm. they, they watch professional players like, I've been trying to copy Eagle. I'm, I've been trying to copy Simon. I mean, yeah, mm -hmm. good luck. But <laughs> like the, the best way to throw is to throw like your body allows you to throw. Mm -hmm. And that's why we can distinguish Simon from Eagle just by looking mm -hmm. at their shadows. Yes. And they both throw 700, 800 if they want to, yeah. but they look different or Paul yes. Macbeth or Bradley Williams yeah. or whoever they look different yeah yeah and and uh as compelling it is to copy pro pro forms and try mm -hmm. to look like them it 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 just doesn't pay in the yeah. long run yeah no i i i agree with that and that is something that i think if you're going to be looking at pro form and saying okay what can i learn it's you're looking for the similarities in what they're doing, not how they're doing it. So you yeah. want to look at things like their timing. When are when do you see in slow motion in real time 
elements of their body knowing what their arm's going to do and coming in before that to prepare the arm for that swing. So looking at how the lower body's reacting, looking at what the torso is doing mid throw and post throw and and obviously the arm as well. When you start picking up on those patterns, it doesn't matter what what the individual looks like throwing because all those people you named all have uniquely different form. And we didn't even throw it and we can throw in James Conrad and Eric Oakley and <laughs> you know Katrina Allen and Kristen Tatar and Owen Scoggins like all of them have uniquely different form and yet they can all throw the disc uh they all throw the disc in a way that works for them but what you see is that they all have these little points where they're all doing the same thing it just might look a little differently and i think if more students can start picking up on those things that's when they're going to start realizing a, a improvement in their form and obviously then with form comes better scores better throws and that kind of thing so yeah i yeah, really appreciate also, that insight yeah one thing that is really overlooked is of course we're talking about form but mm -hmm. some people including me they caught they they get caught up with like trying to improve their form always yes. and always yes. but they forget about we we need to score lower right like i mean that's the ultimate goal to play mm -hmm. well mm -hmm. yeah yeah but my form is still a bit off so you mess <laughs> up your whole game in pursuit yeah. of looking better yeah and then we have James Conrad, who's a world champion, a USDGC ch champion, and nobody really wants to throw like him, but mm -hmm. we sh sure want want to score like him, right? Yeah. So, what are we trying yeah. here? <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, that's definitely something. You know, I think we all, at one point or multiple points in our disc golf careers and journeys, like find ourselves like fixating on one thing. And it's like you do realize, like you only drive. 18 times around, but you guess what? You also putt 18 times around, or you also approach 18 times around or more, <laughs> you know, obviously, yeah, those numbers aren't exact because, uh, some holes you have to throw big drives twice, but you get the point of there's so much more to actually improving. And that's when one thing where I've had this school of thought and I, you know, I'll be honest, it's probably not very popular because it's not encouraging people to throw four to 500 feet. But I'm like, hey, if you can throw three to 350 and you can do that with control and with accuracy, you can pretty much shoot however you want to shoot on almost any disc golf course. Like, sure, on yeah. some of these pro level courses, you're not going to shoot a 10 under if you can't throw 450, 500 feet on a dime. But if you can throw three to 350 on like the average disc golf course that most people play on and you know how to approach the basket with control and you can make 70, 80 percent or more of your C1 putts. Like you're going to be beating a lot of people um, because a lot of holes don't require more than 400 feet of power to be able to get even just a par. Now, obviously, there are outliers there are things that don't line up with that but i think sometimes we just get so fixated on man i gotta be able to throw 500 feet to to really improve and really shoot low and it's like no 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 it's okay to keep working towards that but hey you can throw 350 right now or you can throw 375 and you and because you can continue to do that that's going to help you in so many other ways especially if you can do it backhand and forehand i think if you have those two tools that really helps you tackle so many courses and you can continue working on form. It's really just more of a mental thing. I think like being able to like, Hey, if we can remove our heads a little bit from trying to do something absolutely insane, like throwing 500 feet, which very few people percentage wise can do like, and be like, Hey, but I can throw this far. And if I just focus on these other elements of my game, my score is actually going to drop a lot more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and it's a humbling experience to get beat by that six-year-old yes. guy who who throws a, with a lousy yeah. form, three fifty, and he, yep. he he can play three under at best, but he still yeah. beats you every time when you're looking for your disc from the OB at, yeah. at like five hundred from five hundred feet. He's in the middle of the fairway with his three hundred footer, 
and mm-hmm. he beats you every time and he's having fun also mm-hmm. doing that yeah <laughs> Yeah, because he steps up to a 20-foot putt and he's not shaking. <laughs> you know, he's yeah, like, yeah, I'm yeah. going to make this. 20 feet yeah. is in my range. I'm going to make this. So, yeah, yeah. I, I, I completely, completely agree. So we've sort of already kind of have gotten into this a little bit. But um, are there any misconceptions about the backhand that maybe happen from people just getting into the sport or maybe from, like, They've been playing and they've been hearing a lot of things. That is there any misconceptions that we need to address to make sure that everybody is on the same path and everybody's doing the right thing? Yeah. So so when I started and started um, like uh, looking into this mm-hmm. whole mess of uh, form and instructions, there used to be two big schools of thoughts. And they were kind of contradicting, but they also were all, um, always told uh, uh, in this, uh, at the same time. So first is pull like you're starting a lawnmower and also mm. rotate as fast as possible. So you cannot mm. do those two things at the same time. Mm-hmm. And at this point, I think the pulling motion is closer to the truth than rotating as fast as possible because you really have to use the arm more than the body. And people who try to rotate as fast as possible, they tend to do rounding mm-hmm. because they they throw their body around forgetting that they also need to move the disc, mm-hmm. which causes the rounding. So no. I, I would say do not Think about rotating as fast as possible. Let yeah. the body rotate as the disc is launching out. Yeah. yeah. I, and I will, I can speak to that because one of my issues from when I started playing six years ago was rotation. Now, at that time, I wasn't thinking about like the two schools of thought, like someone like you who's been around the game for so much longer. But yesterday I was playing and Obviously, yes, the heat, the humidity, discs sticking, a lot of grip locks. But I did feel like as I was trying to throw on a couple throws, not all of them, but on a couple ones, especially with drivers, my putters and mids were good. But with the drivers, I felt my shoulders like just rotate a lot quicker, rotate um, before they were supposed to. And what I mean by that is, I wasn't in my follow through yet where my whole torso was coming. It was trying to either without thinking about it, some of that old muscle memory that I've really tried to work out just coming in like, okay, we got to get this disc going on this plane a lot sooner. And so what ended up happening is those shoulders rotated and my body isn't with it yet. And so now the disc is going offline. And so definitely in in the world, like your hip, you know, your body is going to rotate at one point in the throw. It's, it's the follow through. Um, but I definitely think like for er, any early rotation is where players like myself find the mistakes happening, um, uh, with rounding or just with missing the line to, you know, I want to say that it was grip lock, that it was just the disc being hot and sweaty, but if I sit there and honestly think about it, I'm like, you know what? I, uh, I'm i pretty sure I saw the disc come out of my hand, which means my shoulders and everything were already rotated, which means it wasn't grip lock. It was early, unnecessary rotation of the shoulders and upper torso. Um, exactly. That, yeah. you, you shouldn't grip, be seeing lock that a, disc. Yeah. <laughs> you shouldn't be yeah, seeing grip that lock disc is come a, out of your hand. Yeah, uh, grip lock is a euphemism for early rotation. Like, oh, it's just a grip lock. <laughs> no, man, <laughs> you rotated. <laughs> That's hilarious. I never thought of it like yeah. that, but yeah, it's one hundred percent true. Yeah, um, yeah. I think you know. I think that's a big, uh, a really good thing to to be just discussing here and talking about these things. And I do think that going back to the very first point that you made, if you're relaxed like truly relax the 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 element of that early rotation you're i feel like that happens so much because we get tense on the tee pad or in the fairway and we're trying to throw trying to save birdie bogey par whatever it is and so we try 
too hard in a sense, instead of letting our body throw. And um, yeah. Yeah, especially, yeah, I, I think we, we men, especially, we think that upper body power and strength is the mm -hmm. solution to all problems in the world. We just need to use more of our strength muscles. <laughs> and that's why we try to yank the disc as hard as possible using the shoulders and the back mm -hmm. muscles, which can be true if you also relax them at the moment, mm -hmm. like just after you've tensed them. Right. But usually that doesn't happen. We use the power too much and that's why we grip lock. Also, yeah. it, I mean, it's possible that we do grip lock because we are mm -hmm. squeezing our fists together. Yes. Like yeah. fingers together because yeah. like clenching feels like it's, it's, mm -hmm. we're powerful when we clench. Yeah. So, so, oh yeah, this disc oh. is going to spin and fly further because I'm gripping it so much hard. And it's like, <laughs> it might also go 40 feet to the right. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> Very cool. So now I got, I got, we've already, well, we actually have talked about rounding. So I just really have two questions for you before to wrap up this section and before we get into the disc review. Um, I feel like currently there's a lot of discussion about lower body in the throw and specifically front hip, back hip. This is something I've been paying attention to for the last year or two, hearing a lot of, um, points about this. And I have heard and listened to some of your videos. And so I wanted to ask you, um, are we splitting hairs talking about front hip versus back hip? Because won't our hips just move together a as a unit, regardless of which one we're thinking of actively moving? So does it matter which one quote unquote engages or initiates the hip? Or what are, what are some of your thoughts about that? Well, I think, and I'm at this point, I'm pretty sure about this, that we don't need to think about the hips much at okay. all. I've heard so that what we need to well, do, yeah. yeah, what we need to do is we need to set a firm and balanced stance on our front leg so that we can swing our arm freely and the weight shift, uh, is basically that. So mm -hmm. when we're doing the weight shift, we just uh, set up the stance, firm balance stance on our front leg, and then we swing the arm. It of course happens at some point, usually before even the arm starts, that the back hip will start rotating and it shows in the back knee mm -hmm. or in the back foot, twisting forward. Mm -hmm. But that is really just a reaction to this uh, weight shift plus the shoulders and the arm rotating open to the target. Yeah. So we, we cannot rotate our body opening to the target without the hip involvement. Mm -hmm. But the front hip is basically just, it's, it's just a support and the mm -hmm. back hip is just a reaction. So the hips are not that important. And if you look at um, still photos of David Wiggins, which I think is the, I mean, he's a distance guru. He doesn't mm -hmm. play disc golf that much. But if we yeah. want to e examine the prime example of the biggest thrower ever, mm -hmm. his hips don't really open before the release at all. Mm -hmm. They open just a little bit so that you are not closed, but they are squared to the target. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think Josh from Overthrow had a really good post on Instagram where he paralleled that stance with Roger Federer's one-handed mm -hmm. backhand. And it, yeah. they, they look pretty similar. Yes. I saw so the, the hips are not opening. Sure, if you look at Eagle McMahon or Simon... They both have quite open hips at the release, but I don't think you really need to open them. Uh, I mean, especially you don't want to focus on rotating them open because that for sure where will end up you opening them a lot earlier than what you would mm. want. So 
If they open, that's okay. But don't try to open them. They open just because your shoulders are opening. And that's only a reaction for, for, for your movements. But it's really, you, you don't need to focus on opening them. Okay, very interesting. So what you're then, based on our earlier conversation and this thought now, basically what your, your idea, um, your concept of throwing is not just putting the disc then in a straight linear line to the target, but our body is moving parallel to that and that forward motion, uh, especially in the X step with that weight transfer or that weight shift or that gliding over onto a brace, like whatever you want to call it is what's going to be generating that, generating that power. Am I Yeah. So we're stop. Yeah. We're stopping our momentum mm -hmm. and because we're stopping the momentum on one supporting point only, the momentum mm -hmm. will then continue around that. Okay. Uh, supporting point, which is the front okay. leg. And that's and why so we then, rotate. And then, and that's then why you talk about like for yourself specifically, you prefer the one step to the standstill because it gives you that transfer of your weight of your momentum without having to do the X step. Because if yeah. you're in a natural standstill with both feet on the ground, you have to sort of, uh, you have to force the, the momentum shift on your own which for maybe for some players feels uncomfortable or maybe throws off their timing a little bit. Yeah. I mean, total standstills are very hard. Yeah. If you try to throw hard, like yeah. maximum effort with, with no weight shift whatsoever. I mean, you, you will have some weight shift even in, mm -hmm. a, in the uh, total standstill, but it's really hard. Mm. So just even a bit of momentum will give you a lot more power. And it's just easier, oh, yeah. but I sometimes, I mean, the, the, one of my first like viral videos in English mm -hmm. was the, uh, bracing video where mm -hmm. I compared it to a crash test. Like you mm -hmm. drive hundred miles an hour to a wall. <laughs> and when the car stops, everything from the back seat, the crash test dummies, they mm -hmm. fly forward to the windshield. So that's mm -hmm. something we try to achieve here. We take the momentum and we stop and yeah. everything has to go forward from there. And that's mm -hmm. why uh, the, the back hip also rotates because that, that makes just a lot has to happen. Yeah. And yeah. Oh, yeah, if, momentum. The back, if, yeah. if the back leg is anchored on the ground, mm -hmm. we cannot follow through freely. So it has to be like 90% off the ground. Maybe the, the toes can stay on the ground because they don't really hinder mm -hmm. our capacity to uh, swing the arm around our body. Mm -hmm. But if the back leg is on the ground, nothing good can, can come out of it. Yeah. Because okay. we cannot rotate really open. We yeah. cannot rotate freely open. So, so the arm will be slower because of that, because it wants to protect itself. I mean, the, the body wants to protect, protect mm -hmm. itself from getting hurt. Yeah. No, yeah, that that makes a lot of sense and uh I'm sure I saw that video. <laughs> the 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 crash test one. So no, I get that. So now I have a question. This is something that I and this is the last question before we get into the disc review. Something that I have really started to feel um not strongly about like argumentative, but something that I feel like I've been seeing a lot as I look at different forms is the non-throwing arm. Now, I am not at all someone who says the non-throwing arm, actually, you need to use somehow to make you throw further. The way I talk about the non-throwing arm is that it is indicative of your timing, of, being, of getting the disc forward, creating this lag that we do want in our throw in order to generate that power. And so one of the things that I talk about is that arm coming in while that disc is still behind that back shoulder to create that lag. Cause if they, if the shoulder, if the arms kind of move, uh, simultaneously, you're not getting lag. You're not getting that delay in the throw. So I 
when I talk about the non-throwing arm and coaching is like, hey, you want that to kind of come into your side beforehand. Now, I've gotten some pushback from some people on that idea because they're like, oh, no, you don't even have to worry about the non-throwing arm. So I was wondering, what is your position on the non-throwing arm? How do you coach it? Do you coach it? That kind of thing. Well, that's the most requested video from me, the non-throwing arm, how to use oh, it. Wow. And I always refuse to talk about it because you don't yeah. have to think about it. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Uh, people ask me about this and I tell them, if you relax and you need to relax and mm -hmm. the shoulders are relaxed, that means your non-throwing arm is also <laughs> relaxed. Mm -hmm. When your body moves forward and stops and your arm is relaxed, there is mm -hmm. no other way for it to go than to the side of your body. Mm -hmm. That's That has to happen. I mean, yeah. that, but if you tense it and you try to time it somehow, well, good mm -hmm. luck thinking about your non-throwing arm when you need to aim with the throwing arm. And mm -hmm. also, like, you have so much things to think about that yeah. are in front of you, including mm -hmm. the gap and the target, the basket, everything. You are aiming somewhere, and then right. you're shifting your focus on something that's behind you. Right. That doesn't make sense to me. Some people think they get some power from the off arm. Mm. I think mm. that that's not true. Your throw right. with your throwing no, I arm. Agree. I agree. Yeah. And you, you can only make, I mean, you, you cannot make your arm faster with the off arm. You can only slow down with the off arm if it's, if it's slamming the other way, which then mm -hmm. also prevents you from following through cleanly. So yeah. uh, the off yeah. arm, uh, if, if there's something you need to do about it, well, tuck it to your side and that's mm -hmm. it. Yeah, you see players keeping their non-throwing arm on their back quad the entire time. You see someone like Maria Oliva, she throws that way. And I remember asking her in a in a comment, just like, hey, why do you do that? And for her, similar to what you just said, she doesn't think about it. It's just what she does. And it's just one of those things where, yeah, I know like I've uh, I talked about like, yeah, we want that arm to come in. But it's this idea of we're not thinking about forcing it in. But just by being in a relaxed state, that arm is naturally should naturally be coming in before. And it's just one of those things that we should be observing in our form when we throw. Uh, so, yeah, so I really appreciate you answering a lot of these questions, giving some clarity on those things. But now uh, we're going to go to the disc review. But before we do, if you guys are interested in working on this skill and you want some help, you want some coaching, you can go ahead and DM me on Instagram or on Discord. First session is absolutely free. We'll have a virtual session. We'll chat for 30 minutes. We'll analyze your form and we'll talk about some things. First session, absolutely free. And uh, all you have to do is message me and let me know that you're interested and we will get something sorted out. So make sure, of course, if you want to continue improving your form, even outside of direct coaching that you're following and subscribing to me on Instagram and YouTube. Also check out Yanni. Uh, on Instagram and YouTube as well for more coaching uh, and instruction there. So now let's go ahead and let's get into the disc review. Yanni, when I asked you, what is your favorite disc? You said the Axiom NB. It's a neutral to overstable putter depending on the plastic. It comes in a variety of plastics and depending on where. So I'll let you sort of take control here. What is it about the NB that you love? Uh, why is it your favorite putter and what does it do that you love the most? Well, I've always liked, I love throwing putters. And when mm -hmm. I started, I threw mostly AVRs. I mean, okay. well, my first ever disc was Innova XD. They don't make them anymore. Oh, uh, yeah. XD. <laughs> yeah, really shallow putter. Yes. And Envy reminds me of that. So mm. it's a shallow putter. It feels faster than mm -hmm. other putters. It's also reliable because it's an overstable one. And just it just sits in my hand really mm -hmm. well. I mean, my fingers feel like they belong there. Mm -hmm. And that's also the disc I use um, on my coaching sessions too. So I have like 15 of them 
And nice. we basically only throw either, yeah, well, basically only Envy's. Yeah. So all of my students also when before Envy was that popular as it is now, mm -hmm. and I introduced the Envy to my clients. So also their sales probably got yeah. <laughs> like a big boost in Finland because people, people, hey, what was the disc yeah. we were using? It was yeah. Envy. Okay, I'll, I'll need to get a few. Yeah. Like also people really like, got hooked on that. Why is Finland just behind the Envy? <laughs> yeah. Like what is going on over there? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it's, great. It, it's so easy to throw. It's so easy right. to throw. I mean, you, you need to know how to throw all putters also, but mm -hmm. Envy just makes it a bit easier to throw a putter yeah. because it's it's shallow. It doesn't stick in your yeah. fingers. Is that also what you putt with, the Envy? Um, I putt with Atom. Okay. So it's okay. quite similar feel, but yeah. more understable. Envy, well, I, I think, is a bit too overstable. I mean, especially the yeah. new ones. But once it, got, mm -hmm. once it gets beat in, it feels pretty, yeah. pretty similar to Atom. It's really funny that you say you putt with the Atom because I didn't realize this or learn this until about a year ago, but I putt with like the Mint Bullet or Jester Disc Golf. It's a newer, smaller company in the United States. They have their putter called the Love. It's basically the Bullet, uh, the Praxis, the Atom, but single mold version. And uh, when, you know, I've never really uh, thrown the, uh, the Envy before. It's not been a disc that, I've tried, and I think the reason why is because, as you said there with the Atom, you it's a neutral straighter flight for putting, and I also like that for throwing. Um, and so I may have to one of these days, like actually finally go and like pick up an Envy and throw it and and just see what it can do. But that is a one of the few popular discs that like genuinely have been popular for a while. Not like oh yeah, it's a brand new mold that this person came out with. But like one that's actually stood the test of time that uh, I haven't messed around and thrown yet. And so not a lot. I've thrown it a couple of times when people have had it and I've messed with it. But yeah, I've, I, I prefer that more Heiser flip flight with the neutral, with the neutral putter. Um, but yeah, the Envy is one that obviously going back to the holy shot, you know, for world championship. Uh, got a lot of popularity there. People were like, whoa, the Envy can do that. And it's like, well, I mean. Yeah, the Envy I mean, did it. Yeah. yeah, the Envy did that. It was also the guy throwing it. <laughs> you know, yeah. one of the best. Yeah, a little one bit, of the yeah. Best putt, one of the best putter throwers in the world. So, yeah. But yeah, no, the Envy is definitely a very cool disc. And, you know, I need to definitely check it out. I want, I've, I've heard envy throwers on both sides here some people say they can forehand it they like it for the forehand it's obviously not going to be as overstable as something like a harp or a zone or a toro but do you ever forehand the envy or you don't like that hand feel for oh, it? all the time all the time all the time yeah for sure yeah yeah, yeah. i don't even like i i feel if you need to throw a zone or a harp mm -hmm. to 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 be able to throw a like a, how to say maybe a 250 with a mm -hmm. forehand. I mean, I, I think there's something wrong with your yeah. form. Yeah. You really need to know how to throw a putter for 150, 200 mm -hmm. with a clean release. If mm -hmm. you need some zones, you're doing something wrong. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I agree. I, I definitely think like, especially for forehand, starting with a, a neutral disc or even a little understable will help you clean up it's going to be frustrating very very frustrating in the beginning but it'll help you really dial in that forehand form um but yeah so i so if you guys take nothing else uh from this section i hope you took a lot from the previous section where we talked about the backhand but from the disc review i'm i'm going to have to try the envy i'm gonna to have to mess around with it i know i just published my in the bag but you know what things constantly change i'm not sponsored by anyone so it uh it is totally fine to be trying new things so i'll have to check out an MV for sure and if you guys want to check out an MV as well head to gotta go gotta throw.com and you can use my discount code uh gladiator i'm an affiliate with them and you'll get a discount on your purchase and you'll also be supporting me. I do get some kickback from every purchase. So the Envy has a lot of different plastics. Yanni, last question or last two questions. How many Envy's do you bag and which plastics are they in? Uh, different plastics. I, I think that I have some 
15 at the moment. I might have to buy a few more because <laughs> when you when you coach people on the field yeah. and you throw 20, you just lose them. You you lose the track of yeah. how many you threw and and like yeah. that that just happens. Yeah. Um can't remember the plastic names really, but I prefer the sh the softer ones. The softer ones, so like the base yeah. plastic, the base plastic. Yeah, ones. yeah, yeah, for sure. Yes, because I, like so I, I'm so old there. school. I remember only yeah. the Inova plastics. Yeah, but now I'm I'm, I'm switching <laughs> slowly to MVP, MVP plastics and all these new ones. But yeah. I'm really like, yeah. uh, is it similar to Champion or Star? Like, this is, well, yeah. I, I'm this guy. Yeah, yeah. No, I get you. <laughs> I get you. That's great. That is great. Well, Yanni, it was a pleasure talking with you, man. I'm glad we were able to do this. And uh, if you guys want to have uh, hear Yanni back on the show, make sure that you listen, share, like, subscribe, and uh, we'll try to get him back on in the future. I, I really enjoyed it. And it was a pleasure talking with you, man. Uh, yeah, you too, Antonio. Thanks for having me here. Yeah, of course. Well, We'll wrap up here, guys, like we always do. Remember to go out at Teach Play Disc Golf. Let's start from the beginning. I It's early in the morning for me, guys. I've been up since like 5.30. Um, remember at Teach Play Disc Golf, we always want to encourage people to go out, teach someone how to play disc golf, take them to the course, give an encouraging word, help them relax, okay? Help them have fun. Make sure that you yourself, you also go out and play some disc golf this week. And uh, that is all for this week's episode, everybody. Until next time, have a great round.